we all get dealt a hand at the end of the day and it's not my job to look over shoulders and say, oh, his hand looks really good oh that hand looks really good my job is to play that hand as best as i can in my story my journey it there's an element of it that defies logic it's not logical for somebody to go through the route that i've gone and got to the level that i've got to in the uk remind me is it the third fastest fourth fastest fourth fastest yeah. soon to be third um to be first. Yeah. <laughs> or first i've got this sort of duality of being an accountant being a sprinter you you can try to pursue both things to the absolute highest level but at some point something's going to break yeah and it's going to be you is it fair to say based on what you've just said to us that if you want to be great then you can't have it all <laughs> that's a good question how many times have we been told that it's never too late to start we've all seen the viral post of oprah winfrey or jk Rowan and even jeff bezos getting started in their 30s and Steve Carell, as well as Samuel Jackson, getting their big face in their 40s. Although we have these examples of practical dreamers, we all know that in reality, it is not that simple. Between dependents, bills, nine to five, and all these other things that come with adulthood, it can feel impossible for us to take the time to really explore some of our ideas and our dreams and our passions. In this episode, I'm speaking with Eugene Amodadzi, the world's fastest accountant. He is the fourth fastest Brit of all time. Most people get started in track and field at a really early age, whereas Eugene started at 26. Join us in this episode as we explore how he turned his dream into his reality. So, Pi. <laughs> that is a terrible thing to start with. The 16 digits. <laughs> Imagine. I, like, I know three, that's all I know. And what are the three that you know? No, I know the number three. three <laughs> what do you mean? I don't know the rest. <laughs> I don't know the rest. I don't even know what pi is for. Is it like something to do with a triangle? It's triangles and circles. I think you use pi to... To what? what do you, I think you can use it to work out the circumference of a circle. That's it. And but when would you ever need to do that? If I'm not an engineer... Obviously, if I'm not an engineer or something like that, then... Mm. Okay, okay, that, that's, that's terrible. If I'm an engineer, or, <laughs> do you know, it might know, be important. Quanti I don't know, do quantity surveyors do that kind of thing? But are they not just types of engineers? I don't know, are they? I would have assumed, I would have assumed that they are. I would assume that they are. Remind me, in terms of like your, your rating, in terms of being like fastest UK wise, where, where are you? Uh, number four. You're number four? Yeah, joint okay. fourth. A fella named Reese Prescott. Okay. Yeah. And where are you? Do you know where you'd be all time? In what? As in UK? Oh, UK. Wait, no, fourth. Your fourth all, all time. time UK. Yeah, I'm That's the fourth fastest British amazing. runner ever. I there's didn't even know there's only three people. There's only three people currently who run faster than me: James Asalu, Linford Christie, and Zarnell Hughes. Damn. That's, I, I knew it's, you was good, but wild. I didn't realize it was that. No, it's wild to me because yeah. I grew up watching like Mark Lewis Francis, Marlon Devonish, yeah. um, Christian like Malcolm, you your... Dwayne Chambers, Wait, Darren you're Campbell. you're faster than Dwayne Chambers? I'm faster than all those guys I just oh mentioned. Oh my God. Dwayne Chambers ran 997. So he's number, where's Dwayne? I think Dwayne is number seven. That's insane. All time. That's literally insane. I, I knew you was good, but I didn't actually deep you was that good. Okay. I don't think I've deeped it myself. Because, <laughs> like, Dane Tabor's, like, is fully, like, some massive no, guy. I, like, no, I had to get what you're saying. He's an imposing figure. Yeah. Um, physically and also just, like... Personality-wise yeah, or all that. But then I guess, even in Dwayne's case, like, obviously, he also had the uh, drug allegations on top of that, so... <laughs> yeah, no, which he talks about yeah, yeah. a lot. He'll, he'll speak about it at length now. Yeah. Um, I feel like a part of what he does now is, I mean, I'm not sure. I feel like it is him. I feel like, I feel like he needs to give back from so a sport. He did that, actually do it, didn't he? Or yeah. Was it that? He, okay. No, he did it. Yeah, he did it. He came out and said, look, yeah, he, it's interesting, you know, when people say like they're willing to do anything to win. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not willing to do anything to win mm. within the confines of, you know, the parameters set by, you know, world athletics and whatever else. Yeah, yeah. But he was willing to do anything. Right. So that meant, like, if I'm, if I need to cheat, I need to, you know what I mean? So how does it feel to be faster than not only, like, a legend like that, but a legend that also cheated? <laughs> you know what? It's interesting because the way I am, I don't... People's like, oh, you, you doped. And then, like, especially the British public, they can be very un unforgiving. Me, yeah. I'm not really like that. So it's, it's weird. I can separate 
the the human from the act. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily like I love Dwayne Chambers because I grew up watching Dwayne Chambers, yeah, I was a big yeah, fan. Yeah. So okay, he had his doping scandal, but he's had his ban, he did his time, and to be honest, he's he's paid for it, yeah, you know. Yeah materially and as well as I'm sure like mentally and all the things yeah, he's gone yeah, through yeah, since 100%. so but yeah like I don't think I've really I still think there's elements of it that's surreal like Dwayne Chambers what do you mean like I, I, I was a little kid watching this guy yeah, yeah. doing great things and I mean he's done things in this sport that of course I aspire to do in terms yeah. of major championships and stuff but it's wild to me to say okay yeah he's actually below me yeah. when it's all said and done I'm actually higher rate you know so that's wild to me that's mad so, but Linford Christie is currently number two. Number two. Yeah, yeah. But then obviously he then got found for dope and stuff towards the end of his career. But after he set that time, I'm assuming. Yeah. So I think back in his time, of course, uh, there was a few issues with a lot of athletes then. Yeah. But again, to me, Linford is like the, legend. the goat. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, do you know what I'm trying to say? So it's one of those things where um, for me, if like, even like with Justin Gatlin, another mm. example. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I loved everything about Gatlin. You know what I mean? Okay, but he, he took, you know what I mean? He did what he did. and But again, he served his time yeah. and he came back. You know what I mean? And that's all you can ask, okay? Mm -hmm. The sport has said, if you are found guilty for this offence, you get a four-year ban, whatever yeah. it is. And they've done that. So I'm very much like me sitting here under the lens of Christianity and the fact that being born a sinner, but God saying, you know what? I'm going to forget all of those things against you mm -hmm. and accept you because of the sacrifice of his son how dare I then now start to be Trust judge, jury, executioner? It's never going to yeah. happen because by the measure we use, it will also be used against us. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, if I'm out here being judgmental, writing people off, counting them out, whatever, because of something that they've done or a mistake they've made, then my goodness, when I make a mistake, do you know what I mean? What can I yeah. expect to, to come back to me? So that's kind of like my mindset. So all of these guys I've mentioned, they're always going to be legends, yeah. you know, to me. Before I do jump in, I do have one question, which is off uh, off script that I want to know. <laughs> do you feel that you could be number one by the time you retire? I'm trying to be UK? top two, not two. Yeah? Top two, not two. Love it, love it. Now, that's got to be the ambition though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's got to be the, the dream. That's got to be the mindset. I'm not here to just make up numbers. Mm. So yeah, by the grace of God, when it's all said and done, why can't I be regarded as the greatest, the fastest, the best British sprinter of all time? Yeah. And if it doesn't happen, I'm not going to be like crushed and disappointed. It will be a great journey regardless. Yeah. And God will get the glory regardless. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm an ambitious guy. So for me, it's like, why should I put a limit on what I could or could not achieve? Yeah. Just enjoy the journey. Yeah. That's beautiful. When we've spoken before, um, one of the ideas that really came out or came from what you're saying to me is the idea of like leaving this life with nothing left in you, mm. like really utilizing all of your gifts and all of your talent. And when you're explaining it to me, you used like a parable to explain kind of where mm. that idea came from. Could you tell us about that? I can, yeah, I believe it's Matthew 25, um, the parable of the talents. And it speaks about a harsh master who's about to go away on a, let's say a business trip, I'm paraphrasing. And he leaves a certain amount of currency or money and it's called talent with his servants. So to the first one he gives, I believe five, to the next one he gives two and to the last, and you know, he gets to the last one, he gives him one and he goes away for some time and he returns. So the first guy comes and says, hey, look, you gave me these five talents and look, I've got five more. And he says, okay, well done. Good and faithful, you've been good or faithful with small things. So now I'll put you in charge of many things. The next one comes, you gave me two, I've got two more. He said, oh, wow, you've been faithful with small things. I'll put you in charge of many things. And he comes to the last one who gave one. And he says, you know, I need to be a harsh master. And I was fearful. So he buried it. And the master was furious. And he said, if you knew I was a harsh man, why couldn't you at least take it to the bank, earn some interest, and you could have given me something? Because of this evil that you've done, I'll take this one you have and give it to the one of the guys who's got, you know, however many already. And it's, it's just stuck with me forever, since, like ever since I heard that parable. I mean, growing up in a, in a Catholic household, I guess I'd heard the parable before, yeah. but I guess the weight of it didn't really hit me until I'd made a decision to start track and field. And I thought, my goodness, I was the guy, and all, this is almost un, unknowingly, I'd buried the talent. I was sitting on the talent. 
the talent would have been buried in the ground with me. And that's what I spoke about. I don't want to go back to the grave with unspent potential. Every day I wake up, it's an opportunity for me to get out there, get after it. Um, so I said, okay, God, you've given me this talent, this passion, all of these things I'm feeling, all these ambitions I have, I believe is from him. So what am I going to do with it? I'm going to give it to him and then I'm going to get after it. I say all the time, this isn't a passive situation or a passive faith. Yeah. It's active, it's proactive. Um, so that's, that's, that's what it is. So I wouldn't say that that is like a biggest fear or anything, more like a daily motivation. I do not want to go back to the ground and um, I, I want to go back to the ground empty, completely, you know, release all the potential and, you know, all that talent God's placed inside me. I want to spend it all um, for his glory. So when it's all said and done, I hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's amazing. You did say, however, that there was a point where you was the person that was burying that t- that potential, that talent, that gift that you had. What was, what was causing you to do that before? You know what? So I was the guy, you know, put, you know, you always hear those those people who could have been footballers and they say, if not for their you know, dodgy knee, they could have <laughs> yeah, made yeah. it. And I guess for a period of time, I believe that same sort of thing of, okay, if I wasn't doing track and field from when I was a teenager, when I was young, then, okay, by the time I got to 25, 26, 27 years of age, that's when people are sort of at the peak of their career, the peak, you know, the peak of their powers, it's too late. Mm. So I think there was an element of me feeling like, you know, that ship had sailed for me. I think there was an element of believing my own legend. So people used to tell me all the time that I was quick. Yeah. And I was playing football um, socially at the time. And I don't think I ever met a guy on a football pitch um, that could beat me. That is not a draw out. So anyone who's listening <laughs> to this, I'm not trying to draw anybody out. And when you, but, say, when you say beat, you mean beat to the ball. It's an, yeah, it's exactly that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, certain things came easy to me in playing football, you know, and literally just old school, knock it past your man and beat him. And it was just like that. Yeah. Um, so again, believe in my own legend of, okay, I was quick. And if I tried, I could have made it. So for years, that was, was good enough. It's good yeah. enough to know. It was good enough to think I could have done it. So I remember when we had the home Olympic Games 2012, watching it, seeing um, Adam Jamini burst onto the scene. Um, Dwayne Chambers made the Olympics that year too and thinking, okay, if I had done it, I could have been that guy. Yeah. So yeah, I think it was, a, it was a few different things. Fear? I don't know. Uh, would, would fear have been there too? I think fear of being found out. Mm. Fear that you go into the track and field space, everybody to a degree anyway is talented. Yeah. Everybody is fast. So maybe I'm not as fast as I think I am. Mm. You know, maybe I couldn't have made it if I tried. So if I, I just haven't ever try, I'll never find out. So you're almost saying it was more comfortable for you to not actually put yourself to the test so you can continue to believe this legend um, because the moment you try it and if it turns out not to be true, then that, that means something else. Yeah, no, absolutely. And look, for as somebody who, I guess, I spent a, a large period of my upbringing and childhood finding my... Um, my value system or like placing certain value in, I guess, things that are essentially going to pass away. So whether it was my reputation, the things that I could do, the things that I owned, um, I guess the type of people I hung around, I was trying to find my identity in a bunch of different things. So, you know, to your question, to your point, if I then go into the world of track and field and I'm not as good as I thought I was or good as the teachers and my friends thought I was and said I was, then what's going to happen to my identity? Mm. Um, am I still going to feel the same way I feel about myself, you know, walking along thinking I could have done it and then find out, oh my goodness, you know? So I think all of those different things probably played a part in why up until the age of 26, I was sort of sat on this talent and, and essentially buried this talent. Right. So it's almost before 26, the, your potential meant more to you than your reality. <laughs> You sound like one of those, um, you know, when uh, women say, I love women, by the way, again, before people try to come for my neck, <laughs> um, about not dating men with potential yeah. or like, you know, the whole thing about a man who speaks about potential and it's like, okay, you need to see the action. And mm. yeah, I guess in a way, yeah, I guess that was true. The 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 idea of it um, was kind of enough and I didn't, I didn't bother too much about whether it yeah. could actually be a reality or not. And, and maybe I yeah, didn't really want to find out if it could or not. And if I'm honest with you, I think a lot of people that's live in exactly that same space where 
the minute we have to really put our, I guess, our actions in line with our potential, or our words, or things of that nature, that's when it becomes tough. Mm. Because, yeah, if we're not who we think we are or who we think we could be, then that means essentially you've been living a lie. Yeah. Because up until that point where your potential is this unmeasurable, unknown thing, then anything is possible. But until you actually get in the arena and actually try to give something a go, then it doesn't really mean much. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that. I'd 100% agree with that. I think it's it's one of those things where I think a lot of people f- will sooner think about the negatives. Oh, but what if I fell? Or what if it's quite not what I thought it'd be? And I think one thing that I learned by taking that step of faith is it's fun. Mm. I am having a blast. I'm having a great time. Yeah. You know what I mean? A really, really good time. And that's not just when things are going well. I was just about to ask you. Yeah. Are you having fun because you're winning? No, because this is the beauty. Mm. When you get hurt, so in my sport, of course, like health is everything. Yeah. If you're not fit, you can't compete. If you can't compete, you can't do anything. And the sport quickly moves on. So when I'm injured and, you know, I've had a few periods in my career where I've been injured, but what I've grown to learn is these are opportunities to grow. These are opportunities to sharpen other skills that maybe you wouldn't pay attention to as much if you were fit and healthy and everything was great. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm working on my mindset, my mentality. Okay, my, if I can't run, okay, I'm going to be the best in the gym. I'm going to be the best sleeper. I'm going to be the best with my nutrition. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to be the best with the recovery post session. Yeah. It's just other areas that I can optimize and get better. So when I'm back running, my base level is improved. Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, look, I'm speaking to you after, you know, a few years to get to that point. That's yeah, not, yeah. that's not how I was at the beginning. So how was that at the beginning? <laughs> I was like a, a spoiled brat mm-hmm. because, so you start a sport and you think, okay, this is what God wants me to do. So, there's this part of me that thinks everything's just going to be plain sailing from that point. And I didn't have any expectations of like, you know, I guess becoming what it's become and God willing will become in future, but it was just, okay, something new started, but I picked up an injury. So my first season I started winter 2018 and I had my first hundred meter race in April, 2019. I ran 1093. And then I think my coach reckoned I was in, 10 4 10 5 shape so for a bit of context that kind of time would probably put you maybe in a top 70 or so domestically yeah yeah um so again for somebody who came from my background to be in considered in that kind of region that was exciting mm. so i'm gearing up training for this next race after i've run 1093 and he's telling me i'm in 10 4 10 5 shape and i tear my hamstring yeah and i literally i don't think i don't remember the last time i'd cried before that but i hit the floor I beat the track and I was literally saying, God, why? Like, I thought you wanted me to do this. You gave me this talent, you know, for all these years I've been playing football, kind of, I enjoy football, but track was like a different level of passion. Why has this happened? Why am I injured? Like, and I'm thinking about, okay, my coach has told me I'm capable of doing X, Y, Z. So I feel like I've lost an opportunity now. You know, am I going to be able to come back from this? When I do come back, am I going to be the same? You know, like, yeah. all of these doubts start to come did I make the right decision like yeah. should I just get healthy and go back to playing football because I never told my hamstring playing football yeah. do you know what I mean I never I don't think I had one real serious injury but playing at the same football. time it's in your comfort zone ultimately yeah, yeah. fair no you're right and I think almost with the story and a little bit of what you were talking about before there's like an idea that's starting to come through for me which is it's not until you begin to like push yourself into something new, step out of your comfort zone, try and actually see how far your potential and your talent can go. That's when you get all these side benefits. Um, like, yeah, like things like you spoke about before, your maturity mm. or all these other kind of habits and routines that yeah. even if you wasn't going to continue to go down the True. athletics pathway, they'll make your life better. True. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, and that's, 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 and that, that's, the, and that's what I mean about when I say to people that, you know, all these things, all these things that you're going to think are going to go wrong and the negatives that keep coming into your mind. And it's just a lot of the way we're, we're geared that way. You know, when you think about stepping out of your comfort zone, you tend to think about the things that can go wrong yeah. and not what you can learn and how you can grow. But honestly, as I sit here with you now and I'm talking in the context of sport, but it can really be applied to anything and everything. Mm-hmm. My faith has grown. I thought I'd get stronger, I'd get faster. Do you know what I mean? Those are kind of things, like tangible things that I would, I knew, okay, yeah, if I train, I'll get stronger, faster. But my faith growing, um, resilience of my character, discipline. So being able to set out a goal 
and stick to it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Accountability. I have coaches who set a program and I've got to show up and do the training. Yeah. And there are training sessions when I'm not with my, my team. Okay, so am I the same in the dark as I am in the light? Mm -hmm. When my coaches and stuff aren't there, am I, am I disciplined enough to still do those sessions to the same level? You know what I mean? So there's so many beautiful things that you can pick up in the pursuit of your passions, in the pursuit of your talents. But if you're not even willing to step out and see, you miss all of that. Mm. Um, and that's kind of like, when, I'm, when I talk about my story, is trying to encourage people to step out and do it. Because mm. if, if, if a chartered accountant can go from, you know, like I said, in 2018, when I qualified as a chartered accountant, which interestingly enough was the same year that I started track and field. Um, but if I can go from a nine to five situation, probably similar to a lot of people, you might have a little hobby on the side or you go gym, recreationally, something like that, yeah. to, for people who don't understand track and field, I'll say it like this, I went to the World Cup of athletics, mm -hmm. of track and field. And then not only did I go there, I placed 10th in the world. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, if I can do that, then why can't you do whatever it is you've set your mind to? Yeah. You know, we let our minds and get away. I think that's a fantastic point. Um, and I guess, it's interesting you say you, it was the same time you started track and field the same time you qualified mm. but something else important happened that year as well right yes same time i got married yeah so three you know massive things i'd say in terms of shaping the type of life that i was i would have and yeah. it's probably also speaks to this interesting like those are three competing demands as well like because mm. we just got married it's meant to be like the honeymoon period and one of the early conversations was, oh, hey, babe, like, I know we've been married a few months. I want to pick up this new hobby. It means that I'll be out the house on Tuesday and Thursday evenings. You know, would that be okay? And I think when we both agreed that, yeah, that's cool, no problem. I don't think either one of us realised. And at the same time, I've just become a qualified child accountant. So I'm trying to forge a career in that field and, yeah. you know, step up the different rungs of the ladder that, you know, you, you start off at low level and eventually you become like a director or, you know, chief financial officer. So again, figuring out how that's going to work and, you know, okay, I'm at the bottom now. How am I going to get to the top? Yeah. And then, okay, I'm in track and field. So no, there was no expectation or anything like that to, to do anything. But again, because of my mindset, I still want to excel at everything I do. So I think from 2018, it was just constant competing demands of like family, career and passion. Yeah. And, you know, and how do I make sure that neither of these things, like none of these things suffer? You know, how do I make sure I'm the best for the family, best at work, but also, you know, improve as, a, as an athlete and yeah. yeah, very much something still to this day that I'm, you know, still juggling. Balancing. And I think in terms of you being able to balance all those areas, it does. And also, I guess one of the reasons why a lot of people don't start is because they don't have that support system around mm. them in order to like really make that work. Mm. And from your story, I feel like you definitely have that there in place. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more around that? Sure. Yeah. No, I think, of course, like it's not just I just got up and decided to be an athlete and then, yeah, I've elevated myself to this level. Um, for sure. Big shout out to the missus. I always call her my MVP because literally she's like the key cog like if you take her out everything kind of just collapses because for me and it's an interesting one and it's a it's a word to people when they're out and they're thinking about you know getting married and spouses and whatever else like for me I have this peace and comfort and confidence I go away on a warm weather camp for three months three months three, three weeks, weeks. Yeah. my missus would <laughs> months. Um, and I know that the house is good you know that my daughter's cool, that she's taking care of the household. So I think with her supporting the talent and, and me having that comfort that, you know, even when I'm away, she can hold it down and we can, you know, get make it work. Like you say behind every, you know, man is a, is a great woman and, and I can testify to that. Without her, this just does not work. Yeah. And then my employers, like you rarely find a situation where, especially when it's eating into their time and I've signed a contract with them and they're mm -hmm. paying me. Right now, I'm not a professional athlete. I don't have like a professional contract, but they've been, even when I was at a level that just domestic, supported it, you know what I mean? Whether they need to move around things in my contract and stuff like that, they've always been really, really supportive. Um, really, really encouraging, you know, short notice. I need to go, oh, my agents just come through. I need to, you know, go to this race in Europe. Okay, no problem. 
you know, do, go for it kind of thing and, and just helping to work around my schedule. So I think, yeah, I've got different people in my network who I guess grace me. But I think also, yes, like a strong support network is obviously needed, but I guess me being the pilot of, of my destiny, God is the pilot ultimately, but me being, um, I guess, hands on deck, the one, the one on the ground, I certain I need to steer those support networks in the direction that I need them to go kind of thing. So I think for me, it's having those open and honest conversations. Like we've all got different, you know, things that we may perceive as obstacles. Mm. Okay, I've got this obstacle. I've got this hurdle in the way. How do I work around that? And that's the question people don't ask. Yeah, They just say, well, there's a hurdle there. Or surely I can't get past that. So they don't even try so yeah. i think a support network is definitely a supportive network is definitely important and it's good but there's a there's a part of okay if it's not quite where you feel like it needs to be for you to do what you want okay how do we get it there yeah and then again look look at me right now okay great support network but i compete so i was 10th in the world i was talking to my coach today and he reminded me that the guy who was number nine was the world champion from last year fred curley mm. and i think the guy who's number eight is the commonwealth champion you know, and you, I'll go further down the list and all of these guys live and breathe track and field. That's all they do. Yeah. You know, whereas I'm competing against these guys with a completely different setup, mm. you know, but I've not looked at the fact that I've got, you know, responsibilities as a husband and a father or the fact that I work a nine to five, you know, I'm still a full-time accountant. I've not looked at these things as, ah, oh, I'm not going to be able to get to that level because of that. I'm like, okay, cool. That's my situation. Okay. How do I make it work? Yeah. I would say to my team, okay, this is my situation. I can only see you guys two times a week. So how do we make that work? Yeah. And that's what I'm about. We all get a we all get dealt a hand at the end of the day. And it's not my job to look over shoulders and say, oh, his hand looks really good. Oh, that hand looks really good. My job is to play that hand as best as I can. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm about, really. No, I love that. I think kind of going on that point about playing the cards you've been dealt. So yeah, like we all like at different points in our lives, we all have different things, good, bad, etc. cetera. Um, I know like in my case, like dyslexia is a big thing that has impacted my life, uh, but it comes with disadvantages, 100%, but it also comes with certain strengths that go alongside that. Mm. And I think no matter what it is that somebody has, like it could be their, their home situation, it could be their, the where they grew up, it could be whatever it is their finances right now. It's like, yeah, there were pros and there were cons with each one of the situations. And even when you just have cons, that's still your card. Mm. So regardless, it's like you can either complain about it or we can find a way to to try and make it work. Yeah. And I think another thing that you've been saying that I really, really love, but it reminds me of a quote that uh, one of my favorite artists says, like he uh, he's like really blown up in the last few years. And he has a quote where he says something on the lines of, you'll be surprised by a number of people that will be willing to help you push when, you, when they see you actually get out and try and start something for yourself. Mm. And with your story, you talk about these support networks and opportunities and people that have been willing to invest into you. Mm. They, none of those people could have got on board with your story if you didn't make the decision for yourself. This is where you want to go. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely want to commend you on that. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you haven't already, make sure you sign up to our mailing list at dreamnation.co forward slash mailing list. And from there, you'll be able to find out about all the things that we have coming for you. The question I do have now is great that you have your support, but for people that are listening right now who don't have that support, it's more than just an obstacle that like literally the support is not there. They don't have mm. that network around them. Mm. Do you have any advice for them? Don't let the dream die because, so I'm, I started when I was 26. So maybe somebody might be listening to this and thinking, okay, as the situation there is right now, there really is no way out right now. And then they might tell themselves, okay, cool. If I can't do this thing right now, then it can't happen. Mm -hmm. But I want to encourage them that if I can, because everybody keeps saying I was a late starter and I'll tell you a story. So at my first British Championships, um, people who listen to this might know who Steve Cram is, like a legendary distance runner. Mm -hmm. I think he ran 1,500 metres or 800 metres. Um, and on commentary, just from seeing my age, he says, Eugene Amadadzi, he's 27 now getting on a bit, but running as fast as he ever has. Mm -hmm. Because he saw the age and he thought, well, I know track and field. And if someone is going to do something in this sport, 
I'm going to know about them when they're 19, 20 years old. Yeah. Um, so f- for that person, I'll say that it's never too late. So maybe right now, your situation doesn't allow, but keep the passion alive, keep the dream alive. If it means that you just do it at a lower level, and I say to people all the time, the first thing you need to do is understand what the fundamentals are of whatever your field is and just just work on that. Literally, just just work on those things. So you know I mean, so and then when you get into a situation, maybe where God willing, some of those obstacles start to move, then you can revisit it and just know it's not too late. Because, like I said, to me, I keep saying my story, my journey. It there's an element of it that defies logic. It's not logical for somebody to go through the route that I've gone and got to the level that I've got to. Yeah. Um. There's no logic to it. So, like I said, and I wasn't even somebody who was sat there sort of thinking, okay, when I was younger, maybe it wasn't the right time. And then 26 was the right time. I, I, there's an element of, um, I'd say God used people around me to push me into that situation. So I'd say to that person, yeah, just don't let that dream die. Yeah. Because it really isn't ever too late. I genuinely honestly believe that. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, sit here and just, you know, empty words. That's not what I'm about at all. Yeah. <laughs> nah, nah, that's a great advice. In the topic of, uh, once again, utilizing all the gifts, skills, et cetera, you have one thing which I definitely encourage most people to do is think about how they invest in themselves. Mm. And you've had to make a lot of investments and a lot of sacrifices in order to now be in the UK. Remind me, is it the third fastest? Fourth fastest. Fourth fastest, yeah. soon to be third. Um, soon to be first. Yeah. <laughs> or first. <laughs> so with that said, like, tell us about, I guess, some of those sacrifices and investments that you needed to make um, to be where you are? I think, I mean, there's obviously with everything, unfortunately money makes the world go around as they say. Mm. So I think there was initial, initially probably the first big investment. I mean, money I'd say. So obviously I used to be, when I first started the sport, I was with club coaches. So the club that I run for just have coaches that obviously give their time. So it's more of a charitable thing Mm -hmm. from their part. You pay a club fee, but it's nothing, you know, crazy. And I transitioned after a couple of years in the sport um, to like a professional private coach. Um, and that was a significantly greater sum of money. Yeah. And again, I look at it as an investment in track and field, but then it's also on the other side, a sacrifice because I'm taking that from the family pot mm. of goals that my, my wife and I would have had and said, okay, hey babe, you know, my contribution is gonna be X amount lower because I'm gonna invest yeah. in this thing. And I guess, at the time, and this is what the tricky thing with investments is as well, because it's not like I started making these investments at the level I'm at now, where yeah. I know I'm one of the best in the world. Mm-hmm. I started making it when I wasn't even one of the best in my country. Yeah, you know, no, probably not even one of the best in my region. Mm. You know, but that's the nature of an investment. It really is. You know and what I mean? Think you're what's beautiful is that you're talking about investments in terms of yourself, your body, your sport, but this is, I guess, a mentality of about investments that everybody should consider, whether Mm. it's business or whatever it is that you're going into, where it is a risk. Like you have to take that step of faith, do your research, hopefully make a good, to make Mm. a calculated risk, but it still is a risk. There's no promises, no guarantees. At all. And another thing that you already just touched on as well. And I don't know if you like quite put the two together, but every investment is a sacrifice. Yeah. So yeah. in order for you to invest, you have to take it out or somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and then that's obviously what you've done for yourself. But yeah, could, sorry, could you can tell us a little bit more about your investments. Yeah. So I think mean, money is obviously the, the, the big one. And that, just to touch on the risk side of it, because, you know, I start investing and then get injured. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then it's just like, well, I've just made this level of monetary investment and I actually can't even take advantage of the investment because I'm injured. So, but yeah. like you said, that's the nature of the investment. And I think, of course, having a family as well, it's almost like an invest, like you said, the sacrifice or so the time element. Again, taking mm-hmm. time away from family, putting it into the sport. Also, my career progression is another one in terms of if, because I've got this sort of duality of being an accountant, being a sprinter, you you can try to pursue both things to the absolute highest level, mm. but at some point something's going to break, yeah. and it's going to be you. I just I just that's a short story. Something's yeah. going to break. It's going to be you. Definitely. So you have to. It, there's a balancing act to be done. So I think for me, could I have been further forever on in my career now, um, had I not been pursuing track and field? Most likely. Yeah. 
Could I be earning a bit more money in the corporate world? I mean, I earn good money, but could I be earning a bit more if I wasn't doing track? Most likely. Yeah. But again, that's a decision, a sacrifice, an investment I've decided to make, you know, into into the into the sport of, of track and field. Um, you know, when you have children, they grow so quickly. Mm -hmm. So when I go on a, a three week uh, training camp or when I was at Worlds, it was a three week. So you have a holding camp and then you have the competition itself and then you come back. So that was a three week. Um, you miss so much yeah. because they're so young, they develop so quickly. You come back and you think they're almost a new person, yeah. you know? So of course you're talking to them, you know, FaceTime and stuff like that, but it's not, not quite the same. Yeah. Um, so these are some of the things, but I took one of my training partners. Um, he's an inspiration to me. His name's Felix String, he's a para athlete, he won in Tokyo 2021. And we were speaking about some of the things that we feel separate, you know, good from great or great from the greatest is, isn't isn't talent or how hard you're working or, or any of the things that people might say first off, it's, it's actually what you're willing to sacrifice, mm. um, in, in our opinion, because there are certain people who are willing to go to a place that maybe you're unwilling to go. Yeah. Um, and I'm talking within the, the confines of, you know, the sport legality. in my case and the legality <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. of society before anybody misunderstands <laughs> me yes. i'm not again we, we spoke a little bit about it offline about i'm not willing to do anything it takes to succeed mm. i'm willing to do anything it takes within you know the parameters that have been set out um but yeah we spoke about yeah the thing that we feel really separates the greats is what they're willing to sacrifice you know because everybody has a story i guess of, of things they've sacrificed and to be honest when people see us on the start line in my case you may not necessarily really understand what it's taken for me to get to that point, you know, yeah. other than if I get on a you know platform forum like this and speak a little bit about it. Yeah. Is it fair to say, based on what you've just said to us, that if you want to be great, then you can't have it all? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> because I'm somebody who feels like, it's so funny because I was thinking to myself today, like, this gear coming up, I want it all. Mm. Um, but you're right. I think there's an element of not, it's not so much that you can't have it all because it comes down to what your expectation is. So I, I've already, ex I expect that there'll be certain areas of my life that for a period or for a season, they may not be as fruitful as this area, Yeah. but I'm ready for that. And I know how I'm going to manage that and get through that, you know, with, with the people that I've got in, in you know, in my, my support network, et cetera. So I think you can have it all within reason. Mm. And to be honest with you, brother, is having it all even good for you? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like one of the things that, one of my biggest prayers is as we elevate and as I become more well-known and different things like that, because it's funny, I once upon said a time, oh, I want to run sub 10 which is kind of a big deal in, in this world of track and field. I want to do that, but without the things like the fame and like partial celebrity status or whatever that, that goes with that. And then my training partners laughed at me and said, it's not possible for you to run that fast or to have such an achievement and not start to become known. But one of my prayers is I don't want to, like, and track and field isn't a big enough sport for this to ever happen, I don't think. Maybe it might happen. God, I don't want it to happen, but... Mm. I, I can go to Tesco. I can go shops and okay, a couple of people might stop up, spot me and be like, oh, you're the accountant guy. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, that's me. But there's certain people they can't even leave their house. I, I come out people like Beyonce, whatever, they can't, they can't do normal stuff. Yeah. Because so I'm like, be careful about wanting it all because can you handle it all? Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things I say when people say, oh, do you wish you did it earlier? No. Because maybe at a young age, showed a bit of talent, got a little contract, got a little money, I would have gone nuts. Yeah. Maybe I wasn't, mentally where I needed to be, the, the setup I had around me wasn't what it needed to be for, to allow me to thrive. Whereas when I did start being, you know, married, you know, being, having worked in a corporate world for a few years, I was a, little, a lot more mature. Yeah. And I feel like I could handle a little bit better the rigors, you know, of, of um, or some of the pressures that come with, with elite sport. Yeah. What do you say is a common misconception that people have about you? About me? About you. That I'm an extrovert. Okay. And people, I think it's, it's, I think people's going to laugh mm -hmm. when they hear this. But <laughs> anybody who knows me from way back, like, I was the kid who used to go to parties and I'd want to stick with my mum. Or if, like, <laughs> people come around my yard, I'm trying to stay upstairs and not really come down to say hello. I remember my first day at secondary school and I went to secondary school with one of my really, really good friends. And his brothers went there. So he just rocked out 
in the playground, you know, 100 mile per hour playing football, just getting stuck in. And I'm st- stood outside the gate looking in at all the kids playing. And I don't quite know how to like, you know, introduce myself or like, you know, go in. Um, so I think one of the most common misconceptions is that I'm this extrovert. I have extroverted tendencies. Mm-hmm. I think over the years I've learned how to behave as an extrovert. But naturally at my core, I believe <laughs> I'm an introvert. But like I said, it's going to be controversial. I don't think people are going to believe that. Fair enough. <laughs> so with your story, obviously being a, having your corporate career as an accountant and now being one of the fastest people in the world right now, that is quite a duality, as you've already mentioned. Like, how do you, I guess, juggle like holding those two, those two identities at the same time? It's, it's crazy because I literally have to be both of those things. There, there are very few instances where I actually have to be both of those things. So if mm-hmm. I'm training and, and work, obviously no, I'm training, but there are times where things at work might just become a bit crazy. Yeah. So I'll literally mid-session pull out my laptop jump on a team's call, AirPods in, coach, I'm really, really sorry, but I've just got to step out. Car's in the car park and I'm going to jump in. And I think for me, one of the ways that I handle it is not seeing these two things as things that are competing against each other. Mm -hmm. Just, it it is what it is. So if I need to literally wear both hats at the same time, I'll do that to the best of my ability. So if I need to stop a a training session and jump in a car and do a call, then so be it. I'll do that. Um, So I think it's, it can be, a tough balance, but I very much celebrate it because when I'm on that start line, I think I've got a competitive advantage in that a lot of athletes, it's that's their like life. Like the outcome of that race could be food on the table for them. You know what I mean? They might have a contract that stipulates certain, do you know what I mean? Whereas at least right now, I'm not in that kind of situation. So I celebrate the fact that actually there are far more significant and serious things going on in my life Mm -hmm. than track and field. Amazing. So I can enjoy track and field. I can have fun with track and field. Yeah. And I can celebrate the fact that I'm just a chartered accountant who happens to find himself in the world of, of, of track and field. That's what I keep saying. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think that's that's what probably the way I've just, my mindset towards it makes it, I wouldn't say it's easy, but I don't really stop to concern myself about the difficulty, so to speak, of juggling it. I'm just, yeah. I just get on with it. Nah, that makes sense. I hope you're enjoying today's episode. If you are, please make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube or whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. Don't forget to like this video as well. I guess just to give my viewpoint on that as well in terms of having been multifaceted, having different elements to you, it's been a struggle that I've had to myself. Um, It's not easy to describe what it is that I do or who I am because I don't fit in the box similar Mm. to you or you've kind of got yours down nicely now as the world's fastest accountant. (laughs) So I love that, Brandon. Might have to come to your PR person at some point. (laughs) That's me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, for myself, I guess I'm balancing building this business. I'm balancing uh, sitting on different different boards of different organizations and then having my day job of being a director of innovation and Sometimes it feels like, okay, because I can't easily describe what it is I am or the things that I do, it almost feels difficult to make the most of everything that I've got in front of me. And that's been, that's been something that I've struggled with. So you know what, let me even ask you, do you have any advice for me on that? I think everybody, you need to celebrate the fact that you have been gifted in such a way that you are able to do these things, but not just do them, do them at a higher level. I think you need to celebrate and tap into that more. And I feel like once you get into a situation where you just accept that that's where you're at and actually it's a strength and not something to um, concern yourself, oh, you know, it's hard to do. Your results in terms of all the different fields you're in are going to speak for themselves. And I think, again, that's another thing that people concern themselves about. Don't worry about, like, literally, just be, be you. Be great at what you're doing and it will all speak for itself and celebrate the fact that you have all of those different things that you can, because exp- at the end of the day, it's just an expression of all the different elements of your character. Yeah. So you're gonna learn different things from one of the different streams or you know one of the other streams. So continue to celebrate it, continue to go down that road of, of discovery, and you're just gonna create great, beautiful things that are gonna you know help people, bless people, encourage people, and ultimately enrich you and your life. Yeah, thank you, but I think, 
as you were speaking, an even better question came to mind for me, which is, I'm sure there's going to be somebody listening or watching this right now. He's going to say part of why they can't feel they can maximize all of their gifts and similar to you, like go to the grave empty is because they don't know what direction to go in because mm. they're good at so many different areas. Mm. Like how, how can they like maximize that? I think, again, we all have been dispensed a level of talent and, and a gifting. And I think for me, so of course, you know, there's the academics, being able to go out there, become a, a qualified chartered accountant. And then of course I found myself in this track and field world and I continue to excel as being an accountant and I excel at being a runner. And for me, it's focusing in on the fact that those are the things that make you a legend. Those are the things that make you the goat of your own life. You're the goat of your own life. You're, the, you're a legend of your own life. And when we focus on those different, because I think for us, the question I always say to people is if you're not sure what direction to go to, or if you're not sure, if someone's listening to it, they say, you know what, I don't even know what my talents are. What are the things that just make you smile without mm -hmm. effort? What are the things that you find occupying most of your thoughts? Yeah. What are the things that supposedly just seemingly just come really, really natural to you? What are the things that you've heard one of your friends or people around you say, oh, I wish I could do that. Mm. Or, oh, I find it, oh, I wish that I could, it was as easy as for me to do X as you. Those, those are the things you need to be looking at. And, and those are the things you need to be stepping into. Um, a lot of people want to look at, and we spoke about it a bit earlier about the cards and their hand looks really, really good. Mm. You know, oh, I wish that was something that I could do, but there's, one or two or just one thing or whatever that you're really good at you know and i think if you take your eyes off of the things that you think you cannot do and start focusing on on those areas that come natural and and just feel you know right and you don't then no real effort needs to come into it kind of thing then you'll find kind of where you're meant to be at and then you can go down that path of of discovery yeah. um so with what you're saying, there's almost an assumption that the things that you're good at are also the things that you enjoy or that you care about. And there's going to be a lot of people out there who have these gifts and these talents mm. that they're commercially viable. People think they want, people want this from them, mm. but it might not be what you find any joy or passion mm. in. What would, what would somebody do if they find themselves in that situation where their talents and their, their I guess their passion don't line up with each other? Mm, that's a good question. That is a very good question. I've heard people say, um, I've heard, fo is it, yeah, I've heard, I'm, I'm sure I've heard footballers talk about the fact that they're good at football and, but they don't really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But what they do enjoy is the lifestyle that it gives them. Um, and I guess the, the material wealth that they're getting from it. Yeah. So I guess if someone's in a situation where they feel like they've been gifted with something and for whatever reason, their level of passion towards it isn't quite the same. I would say, what are the byproducts of that talent? Is there something in what that talent produces that you enjoy? And it literally could be as simple as money. Yeah. You know, I'm able to monetize this thing. I like money. So you pursue it <laughs> for that reason. Or yeah. you like talking to people. So maybe your talent allows you to be, you know, relate to people and build relationships and collaborate and that yeah. kind of thing. You know, maybe that specific thing that you're good at, you may not necessarily enjoy it, but it gives you an opportunity to build and collaborate in such a way that you then end up doing, off the back of something you're just good at, but you don't necessarily enjoy as much, you then end up being able to do something that you actually genuinely enjoy. I know I call myself the world's fastest accountant, but I, w I wouldn't necessarily say joy is the first thing that comes to mind when I think about, okay, um, summarizing, you know, board reports or, you know, putting together a, a, a deck, you know, to explain how well the commercial division is done in my company or anything. Like, I can't say I get excited about, you know, crunching numbers, yeah. you know, smashing through Excel spreadsheets mm -hmm. and formulas. I don't get excited about any of these things, but what it does do is give me a certain level of income that allows me to pay my coach, that allows me to, you know, do things in a track and field world that yeah. I do enjoy. And I think, that's such a beautiful level of practicality because <laughs> if I'm being real, I've coached many people, um, spoken to many people and like the ones who go the furthest are the ones who are able to separate what needs to be done in order to accomplish what they really want. Yeah. And 
in reality, I think when sometimes we start a business or sometimes we pursue like a creative endeavor, et cetera, we get so swept up with, no, I need to enjoy every moment. I mm. need to love every moment of this. That's just not the way life works. 100%. And like, some, like we need money. We need those resources. <laughs> we need those things in order to invest into the things that really do matter to That's us. It. And I think if we kind of develop the mindset of, let me make and let me make my income or whatever you need from one area of my life so yep. that you can invest it into the area that you want to eventually become your life, yep. then that's when you get the results you want. And I, yeah, I feel like your answer practically <laughs> gives people that example. Yeah, no, that's a beautiful way to, to sum it up as well. I think that's, that's exactly it. There's one more idea or one more concept that you've spoken about to me, which I really do love. And I'd just love to, I'd love you to share it a little bit more with that with our audience, which is no one can beat you at being you. It's facts. Yeah. What does that what does it mean to you though? It's facts. Nobody can beat you at being you. What it means is that when you're authentically yourself, you know, when you're your truest self, nobody can replicate it. It's literally impossible. Joe, I mean, I think we live in a society of comparison and you know, there's a, a scripture that speaks about comparison being a thief of joy. Mm -hmm. And it genuinely really is. And the the other thing that comparison does is it takes your eyes off of your own lane. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, like I said, when I say nobody can beat you at being you, I'm encouraging people that there are things that are unique to you. There are things that only you can do legit, genuinely things that only you can do the way you do them. Um, the way you look, the way you look at life, whatever it may be, that's unique to you. And these are things that you need to celebrate. And when you do that, when you pursue those things, you've already won. Yeah. You've literally already won. So for me, at the end of the day, if I'm true to myself and I'm authentic and I've been honest with myself and I've pursued those things that are in my heart and my mind, I've already won. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and literally it's as simple as that. Yeah. Comparison being a thief of joy. I think that's a, an expression we hear so much, but I don't think, I don't think really deep it. Like, just how true it is. Listen, I, so when we spoke offline and I spoke about, and I, there'll probably be people listening who watched The Ultimatum, mm. the show on Netflix, rubbish show, but just something to watch. And it's just interesting because they go into this experiment and then the other people on the experiment and they swap spouses. spouses. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, some of these people just get a little bit lost in the source of, oh, well, this person does that, what my, and they stop appreciating things that has even got to them, they might have been with their partner for X amount of years and had good times. They don't think about any of that stuff because yeah. they're thinking, oh, well, oh, I'm, I'm sleeping with this guy and he don't snore, but my yeah. guy snores or, oh, sh she knows where she wants to eat when I ask her where we want to go. But yeah. she, my, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden now you're looking at your whole relationship as negative. Yeah. And that's what we do in the society. Yeah. In your life, have you ever struggled with comparison? And if yes, how did you get past that? Ooh. Yeah, I think 100%. Um, I didn't expect you to ask me that question. So <laughs> that's like that. No, 100%. It's funny because I'm, I'm the type of guy you'll see me. I'm obviously an optimist and I'm, you know, very forward. Like, but no, for sure. I think um, even little things like not having uh, a brother and having friends who had brothers and thinking, oh, like, what would that be like? Because I had two sisters. I love my sisters, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, cause, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I think, no, I think I have been in that situation. I'm trying to think what the most significant one I can think of. I mean, even in my, you know, track and field space um, and looking at, especially when you're injured mm. and seeing people go to certain tournaments um, and achieve certain things that you believe that you can achieve too. Yeah. But because you're injured, I, I can't do it right now. Um, and it just makes you feel even worse mm -hmm. about the situation, situation that you're currently in. And yeah. those things I spoke about, about, you know, growing and you, it just doesn't happen because you're too busy just lamenting the fact that you can't do it too. So how did you get past that? I think have a good cry, you know, <laughs> let, let the emotions work their way through. Yeah, that, yeah. I think that's the thing people miss sometimes, especially for somebody like me, who's very like, go get a kind of person. Mm. You you almost don't want to stop and let the emotions flow the way they need to, but it's only going to trip you up later on. Yeah. So in terms of getting over those things, I think for me, yeah, it's stopping and feeling, Yeah. letting those emotions work their way through. And then when that's happened, allowing the people around you to also speak life back into you as well and, and help you out. Sometimes you kind of just want to get through it yourself. You don't really yeah. want people to be getting involved. Without a doubt. So, I'm not going to lie. I was not expecting an answer from you, but 
I think if I'm honest, I can't think of a better a better answer that you could have given <laughs> because for a lot of us, especially men, like we're not often allowed that space even by ourselves mm. or sometimes the world around us to yeah process those emotions process those things that we're feeling like if you're disappointed you're disappointed if you're angry you're angry if you're sad you're sad and i think allowing mm. that space for yourself to really understand what it is that you're feeling like feel it in that moment let it and let it pass yeah it's so key to be able to move forward so yeah i think a lot of people are going to benefit from you sharing that. i hope so bro. yeah Okay, so I do want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank um, you for having me. You yeah. have been a fantastic guest. Uh, your accomplishments, they speak for themselves. Uh, I'm looking forward to watching you become number one in the UK. Amen. And hopefully number one in the world. When Amen. When all said and done. Um, and yeah, keep on pushing. Thank you, brother. But before we do say goodbye to our guests, my final question to you is, who should I have my podcast in the future? I have an answer for you. Do you know Amani Simpson? I know Amani, yeah. Yeah, I think he would be... And um, I, like, I don't know if you have heard his story. Not not fully. I've heard bits and pieces. Yeah. But yeah. I think he has a very powerful story, particularly for the youth. But I think just generally, yeah. if you hear aspects of his story and somebody who almost lost his life and, and, and made a particular prayer. And, you know, I think, yeah, I think Amani Simpson, with all the work he does, you know, he makes the short films and stuff. I think he yeah. would be a really, really good person, actually. Uh, um uh, Amani, we're going to come for you next year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bro. Thank you so much for staying. Thank you. Uh, take care. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. We release a new episode every Sunday, so make sure that you subscribe and follow us so that you never miss out. If you'd like some more inspiration while you wait for the next new episode, then check out the recommendation above. Don't forget to follow us on social media and you can send us a question or a dilemma that you'd like us to answer on the podcast. This is Claude Williams, you've been watching Behind the Dreams and we look forward to seeing you at the next Dream Nation event. Thanks.